The Voice has been falling in the polls. Poll after poll after poll, The Voice is going down and down and down, and the news just keeps getting worse. The recent news poll has yet more bad news. 53% of Australians intend to vote no, versus 38% who intend to vote yes. Only 9% of Australians remain undecided. Now undoubtedly there are some soft no's and some soft yeses in those respondents. However, it is not good news for The Voice. So assuming those numbers are relatively reliable, the Yes campaign needs at a bare minimum to convince 12% of respondents to its cause. And that is the bare minimum. After all, for The Voice to get up, it needs to convince not only a majority of Australians to agree with it, but a majority in the majority of the states. So it needs to win four out of the six states in addition to the majority overall. And therefore, the Yes campaign needs to capture both A, undecided voters, and B, declared no voters. The Yes campaign faces a Herculean, albeit not insurmountable, task. In business terms, the Yes side's customer acquisition cost, or CAC, has now increased. So let's use an analogy. Suppose you sell ice cream. Well, it is relatively easy to sell your brand to someone who already likes ice cream, especially and even more so if they already buy from you. But suppose you betray that customer's trust. Perhaps you dupe them over what the ingredients are. Perhaps you told them that your ice cream is healthier than it really is. Or perhaps your ice cream just starts tasting awful because you change ingredients. Regardless, suppose you betray that customer's trust. Well, winning that customer back is extremely difficult and extremely expensive. The same problem plagues companies that suffer from data breaches. Winning back a jaded customer is much more difficult than persuading an ambivalent customer or retaining an existing one. The Yes campaign is about to realize this because they have been shedding their own customers, so to speak. More and more people have been shifting toward the no side of the camp. And winning those people back is going to be even more costly. Much more costly than winning over an undecided voter and much more costly than retaining your existing voters. The customer acquisition cost for the Yes campaign has gone up. Now, to be clear, the Yes campaign has disproportionately high resources. The Yes side has reportedly raised $100 million in funding, whereas the No side has reportedly raised only 10 to $15 million. So the Yes campaign is significantly better resourced. Furthermore, the Yes campaign has free press and free advertisements from myriad corporations and from universities. In theory, these in-kind contributions could in fact be priceless and take the level of support well above $100 million. Not only that, when a corporation or a university supports The Voice, it implicitly silences its employees, thereby crueling the No campaign's reach. For example, will someone really articulate why they are voting No when the company is pushing Yes propaganda? If they were to do so, they would risk their job or risk a promotion. And many people simply won't do that, especially when cost of living issues are continuing to weigh on people's minds. The question is then, why has The Voice fallen so badly? Why is it that it's doing worse and worse and worse in successive polls? Well, many people who were once willing to give The Voice a chance have simply shifted to the No campaign. They might have been open to hearing more. They wanted to give the government an opportunity to present details and to present a convincing argument. However, the government has simply failed to do so. The government goes and harangues people, goes and argues that people are conspiracy theorists or doomsayers or chicken littles whenever they question The Voice. The government doesn't deal with them as adults, and that pushes people away. And let's look at some clear areas where the government has failed. First, the more information that emerges, the worse The Voice looks. This includes the stated intention for The Voice to push for a treaty and for reparations, as enunciated in whichever version of the Uluru Statement you choose to look at. This appears to be a non-starter with the public. Second, the government has taken an evasive, dismissive and condescending tone throughout the debate. This includes calling no voters those chicken littles, simply for doing due diligence. It includes labelling people conspiracy theorists for asking what a Makarata is, and for digging into the background documents, which are on the government's own website. It includes the wanton and inaccurate claims of, quote, misinformation, whenever people point out factual dangers with the voice, or while the government itself spreads misinformation. The government has simply lost credibility, because it condescends to people and is dogmatic, and appears to be misleading and evasive. This could be why Anthony Albanese's personal approval ratings and Labour's primary vote has dipped in recent polls. Third and relatedly, the elites pushing for the voice simply do not help. It is not convincing when large corporations that people don't trust anyway are pushing for the voice, especially when that appears to be in return for an implicit quid pro quo from the government. On the most generous interpretation, companies might be pushing for the voice because they fear the government will punish them if they don't, or they hope to gain some government favour if they do. This, at least, would involve the companies acting in shareholders' best interests, the directors doing what they are paid to do. However, it's also possible that the directors have simply gone off in a frolic. They're using other people's money to support a pet cause that they feel is trendy and will make them look enlightened. 
In any case, it looks as if the companies are lecturing the public. And this simply doesn't play well, because people like to have things explained to them. They like to be treated like adults. They don't like to be told what to think. The overall issue, therefore, is that the Yes campaign is treating people like mugs. They're telling people to vote in a particular way, commanding them to do so, and castigating them if they don't. But they're simply failing to address people's core concerns, and failing to answer those questions with concrete, clear answers. The Yes campaign is struggling because it appears to be evasive. The Yes campaign is struggling because they're not answering people's clear concerns that they have with the voice. They're simply evading those questions. Therefore, the fact that Yes is struggling should be no surprise. The question is then, could the Yes campaign turn the situation around? Could they get back to a majority? Could they get a majority overall and a majority in a majority of states? Well, like I've indicated, that's going to be difficult because they need to persuade voters who shifted to the No camp to shift back toward the Yes camp. But it isn't necessarily insurmountable. The main hurdle here, of course, is really twofold because the voice has two overarching issues. The first one, like I said, is messaging. They come across as evasive. They come across as dogmatic. They come across as treating people like children and not answering people's questions. When people have a valid question, the Yes campaign comes across as evasive, trying to avoid that question. When people ask about treaty, which manifestly would flow from a voice, because that is exactly what voice architects have said it would do, well, the Yes campaign simply sidesteps, and they call you a conspiracy theorist when you repeat back their own words. It is a truly baffling and astounding situation, and the gaslighting is one of the major reasons people are turning against the voice. So if the Yes campaign is to have any hope of getting back toward a majority, it needs to stop the evasiveness, it needs to stop the gaslighting, it needs to articulate its cause, and it needs to directly address people's questions. So for example, when people ask about a treaty and whether that will flow from a voice, they need to be straight with people. They need to say that a treaty would flow from a voice, and they need to argue why people need not be concerned. That then leads me to the second problem, which is that many of those issues that the Yes campaign is evading on, well, they're simply very unpalatable. People don't want a treaty. People don't want reparations. People don't want a financial settlement. People don't want to see their taxes go up in order to meet a financial settlement. Because let's be clear, if there is a treaty, well, a financial payment would very likely be part of that treaty. And that would likely lead to a special levy or an increase in taxes, because the money has to come from somewhere. And that somewhere is going to be voters and the Australian population. And that is simply manifestly unpalatable, which is one of the reasons the Yes campaign is being so evasive. They don't want to answer questions about all of those undesirable things that people would be very concerned about. And this leads to a bit of a chicken the egg problem. The Yes campaign can't win if it's evasive, but it also can't win if it stops being evasive. And therefore, the Yes campaign isn't a major problem. It seems to be entering a bit of a death spiral, and there's no real way to arrest this situation. The Yes campaign is the architect of its own demise, and there doesn't seem to be anything they can really do to change the situation. But if you've got any thoughts about this, let me know that in the comments below. Certainly, the referendum is not over at the moment, the No campaign can't be complacent, and the No campaign should continue to articulate the problems with the voice proposal. But like I said, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you next time as well.